exploring the world of water, especially hydrohydronic concepts. I became member of PAS Student Wing in 2018, and my journey of exploring, of asking questions, and discovering the world of knowledge began with it. Let me briefly introduce PAS to you, sir. PAS stands for Professor Association for Student Services. This is an organization that aims to promote critical thinking and culture of scientific research through seminars and conferences in academia of Pakistan and across the world. Today's webinar is also being conducted to achieve this very aim of PAS. In order to ease the things, let us talk about the format of webinar. This webinar shall comprise of four sections. In the first section, our respected speaker will talk. In the next, there shall be question answer session. Then there would be concluding remarks for our respected speaker. And then there would be a vote of thanks from president of PAS. Briefly speaking about the purpose of webinar today is, actually the main purpose of this webinar is to understand importance of critical thinking in the context of liberal arts, that is literature, history, psychology, politics, and creative studies. It would also aim to learn how to formulate effective argument, communicate well, and solve the problem in our academic life. Here, I want to make an announcement that the recorded version of this webinar will be available on www.pasts.int.com. We'll also put the link in the chat box. Coming towards the introduction of our speaker, I'll speak a few words about our respected speaker. Mr. Geoffrey Schreuer is today's speaker. He writes about media and politics, education, and other subjects. He is author of the Sound Bite Society, outstanding academic title, and the big picture, why democracies need journalistic excellence. His essays, articles, commentaries, Reviews have appeared in many newspapers, magazines, and journals. Mr. Schreier majored in philosophy, and he holds advanced degrees in political thought from London School of Economics and Political Science and in journalism from Columbia University. Now, I would like to request our respected speaker, Please share his views. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be with you. And I want to give special thanks to Professor Mughal for inviting me to join uh, your ongoing discussions on critical thinking. And um, I think the the um, introduction you just heard provides a, a very nice glimpse into the complexities that we're about to look at, both in terms of the of critical thinking and uh, the liberal arts. Um, my work and project is titled The Logic of the Liberal Arts. And the main point of it is to show the connections between critical thinking, liberal arts, and citizenship. This might seem at first glance to be a challenging and unwieldy project, but in fact, I believe these three concepts are deeply intertwined and overlapping, and their relationships can be mapped. Uh, but before I get into that, um, I'd like to briefly explain the personal story of how I came to the subject. 
about 15 years ago, I traveled with my son to the west coast of the US to look at some small liberal arts colleges. Uh, one in particular that he was interested in called Reed College in Portland, Oregon. He ended up studying there and he still lives in the Northwest today. Um, Reed was similar in many ways to the school I had attended in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. In fact, Reed had been my second choice when I applied to colleges in the 1970s. And when I looked at the course catalog there, um, it reminded me very much of my own college, not contemporaneously, but 30 years earlier during my time. Swarthmore College over the subsequent generation had vastly diversified its curriculum to include many subjects that Reed College doesn't offer. Reed has kept to a much narrower and more traditional model of the liberal arts. So the Reed curriculum, when I saw it, was like Swarthmore's in a time capsule. It struck me that such, a dif such different approaches to liberal education were equally valid and rigorous. Uh, there remain crucial areas of overlap. For example, Swarthmore College hasn't abandoned core subjects like literature, philosophy, or economics, but it has added among other things, Arab, Arabic, Asian studies, Chinese, Japanese, cognitive science, computer science, environmental studies, and many other subjects. Uh, both schools are avatars of academic excellence and both uphold the traditions of the liberal arts in America. So it was my recognition of this contrast between the two triggered by the sense of deja vu I got when I looked at the catalog of Reed that led me to consider the series of interlacing questions that form my book in progress. What do we mean by the liberal arts? What do we mean by critical thinking? And what, are, what do we mean by citizenship? And how are these all connected? So to, to summarize the work before opening up the discussion and questions, I wanna talk about my approach to each of these three ideas in turn, the liberal arts, critical thinking and democratic citizenship. First, what do we mean by the liberal arts? It's a very broad rubric, basically encompassing all education that isn't specifically technical, vocational, or STEM learning, as it's called, science, technology, engineering, and math. And yet, science is in many ways integral to liberal arts education. To narrow the definition a bit, we could say that the liberal arts focus on integrated learning of the three main sectors of knowledge, the natural sciences, the social sciences and the humanities. I should add though that I'm in favor of all modes of education, all organized learning. We need scientists, technicians, airplane pilots, sanitation workers, as well as people trained in the liberal arts. So I'm not a, opposed to any other kind of learning. But as I'll suggest in a few minutes, uh, the liberal arts while not exclusively valuable, do have a singular value beyond those other kinds of learning. <clears throat> the history of the liberal arts sheds some further light on the subject. The concept of artes liberalis, that's the Latin phrase from which liberal arts derives, uh, dates to Roman antiquity and means the skills of a free citizen. It began with the so-called trivium of logic, rhetoric, and grammar. During the medieval period, as universities evolved out of the convent schools of Europe, the quadrivium was added, incorporating arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy, thus yielding a seven discipline model of the liberal arts as they were at the time. Since then, of course, many new fields have been added to that rubric. 
Uh, I'd like to make two further points on this. One is that the actual or origins of liberal learning are not in the Roman world, despite the term, but in the Greek and specifically in philosophy. But when the Greeks used the term philosophy, they meant something broader than what we think of as philosophy today, the love of wisdom. Um, the concept of philosophy has narrowed a bit since then as it's acquired more specific tasks. Um, modern philosophy is basically thinking about thinking and about the most general intellectual categories such as knowledge, being, value, language, and so forth. And as philosophy evolved, it spun off other narrower lines of inquiry, such as in recent times, economics, linguistics, psychology, sociology, political science, many other fields. Because thinking about thinking and probing new areas of inquiry is the job of philosophy. It remains the mother discipline, um, both logically and historically. It's the mother or the stepmother to most of the other disciplines. The second ca caveat I'd like to make is to the claim that the liberal arts trace back to the Greeks, is that many other learning traditions have contributed to and in intermingled with that Western tradition. And I don't want to minimize their importance. Here I'm uh, a victim of my own education, which although it was solid, was largely limited to that Western tradition. And I do think that tradition represents the essence of the liberal arts project, which is to understand and expand the roles of knowledge and rationality in a world that contains enough darkness and ignorance. That project, however, has no national or cultural boundaries. And the animating rational impulse likewise crosses all conceivable um, domains and disciplines. So if my approach seems Eurocentric, uh, I apologize for that, but I'd like to say that it's a personal limitation of mine rather than a bias. Ultimately, what defines the liberal arts tradition for me is that underpinning of rational thought that we inherited mainly from the Greeks, enriched along the way by Arabic and Asian thought, and indeed it would scarcely have survived without Arab scholars. And that rational tradition um, embodied, particularly in modern philosophy, is the sort of the gift that keeps on giving from philosophy to other modes of inquiry. Uh, I'd like to suggest that that good gift takes two forms. One is that, the, as mentioned earlier, many modern disciplines actually emerged directly from philosophical reflection, from the discipline that examines knowledge itself. Uh, and that found the room and the need for new avenues of inquiry. The said form is the actual modes of rational thought, thought that philosophy originated and imbued in and shared with all of those other fields. Whatever we study, we need to be logical, clear, precise, and otherwise rigorous and philosophy trains us to do so, but not just philosophy, as I will argue. Uh, science, of course, is also a quintessentially rational project of studying, measuring, and predicting the forces of nature. The scientific method is, uh, in that sense, science is part of the liberal arts, but not just in that sense. Science is also integral to liberal learning because no complete or balanced education can leave nature out of the equation. The human, the social, and the natural are simply too interconnected for that to be the case. 
I say that in spite of my own very weak scientific education. We study the humanities because we are human. We study the social sciences because we live in societies. And we study the natural sciences because we are part of nature. But there's a third reason, I think, for integrating science into the liberal arts model as follows, because science, technology, and politics overlap and interact in so many ways, modern democracies require a dialogue between citizens, scientists, and politicians. We need, we need citizens who are science literate and scientists who are capable of explaining their work clearly to the public. So science is very much part of the liberal arts and COVID-19 is only the most immediate example of how important it is to listen to the scientists. So now let's talk about critical thinking. Um, I take a somewhat different view than most scholars have traditionally done on this subject. Historically, the term critical thinking is relatively recent. It's only about a century old. It was originally used, for example, by the American philosopher John Dewey and others to apply scientific rigor, rigor to import scientific rigor from science to other disciplines. It wasn't truly popularized until the 1930s and 40s. But while certainly well-intentioned, I think the early critical thinkers were in a sense reinventing the wheel or at least renaming the wheel because critical thinking is, has been with us all along. Uh, it's basically rationality, which is thinking according to rules and reasons. And it's been around for several thousand years. So critical thinking in the narrower modern sense has proved to be controversial and hard to define, and that's because it covers a, a, a large array of techniques and tools. Typically, it's been equated with informal logic, which is a, an important category. It's the set of non-deductive rules and guidelines for thinking that are more or less complementary to the specific deductive guidelines of formal logic. Informal logics rules are not hard and fast like those of deductive logic, but they're more like guideposts for arguing well on one hand, which was the original job of rhetoric, and on the other hand, for avoiding the blunders, blind spots, biases, fallacies, etc., that afflict all of our thought uh, and lie out of the uh, ambit of formal, formal or deductive logic. So attempts to define critical thinking around this laundry, these laundry lists of guidelines for informal logic has, has been problematic. Like the proverbial blind man and the elephant, everyone has a slightly different definition drawing from a common set of such guidelines. Um, they often overlap, but they never coincide perfectly. For example, Ralph Dobelli in his book, The Art of Thinking Clearly, identifies 99 such fallacies uh, of uh, informal logic. And Philip Wood's Dictionary of Common Fallacies comprises two volumes and runs to more than 600 pages. So you get a bit of an idea how, how broad the subject is and how much it's in open system that cannot be reduced to a specific set of rules or guidelines the way formal logic can. <clears throat> Another way of looking at critical thinking is as a form of philosophy focused on the here and now. It's not about, it's not thinking about thinking in general in the, in the most abstract sense, but thinking about your thinking, my thinking, or through that particular text or image or idea 
uh, in the moment, as it were. In the best sense, it's philosophy on the fly. Uh, um, it, it appeals to reasons or intellectual rigor or excellence. Uh, and I think that those all amount to the same thing. Some of the core components of uh, informal logic are separating truth from fiction or lies or opinions, distinguishing facts from values, thinking about language in general and alternative meanings of words and the best uses of words, and examining one's own assumptions and the assumptions of others. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg as it were. A common mistake we make in rhetoric in speaking is trying to get words, individual words, to do too much work in place of more extended argument. You see this with slogans, with sound bites, with tweets, and so on. Uh, the British philosopher Thomas Hobbes made a point in the Leviathan in 1651, which I think still holds up very well. He said, Words are wise men's counters. They do but reckon with them, but they are the money of fools. I think what he's saying there is don't put too much weight on individual words. Let the arguments speak. Draw them out. Don't compress them for rhetorical advantage. Now, these points only capture some of the most important aspects of critical thinking. It's a very broad umbrella. And despite the impossibility of arriving at a precise definition, I'm not opposed to the traditional equation of critical thinking within formal logic. I think that's a good beginning. I just think it's, it's much broader than that. I prefer to equate critical thinking with the entire spectrum of rationality which includes formal logic at one extreme, informal logic in its different varieties in the middle, and at the other end, analytic thinking, which becomes more like traditional philosophy. Here I find it's more helpful to connect than to separate, to connect these as forms of rationality, forms of critical thinking. And the third band of that spectrum, as I mentioned, analytic thinking, in my view, is the heart and soul of the liberal arts. So I'll describe that briefly. Analytic thinking traces to the Greek concept of dialectic. We may think of dialectic as dialogue in the question and answer format. And that was true for Plato. <coughs> Excuse me. But such dialogue is neither necessary nor sufficient for the analytic or dialectical tradition that evolved in Plato's shadow and under his influence. I would describe it differently. It is first of all thinking that makes distinctions and connections, which are the molecular bases of all thought. Um, if I may repeat that distinctions and connections are the molecular bases of all thought. We have no more basic intellectual tools than the linking and delinking of things. That's how we individuate things in the first place and decide what to call things. We distinguish things that would be otherwise be undifferentiated and connect things that would otherwise be connected. But that's just part of the story because whenever we make a distinction, we also obscure a connection, at least implicitly, and vice versa. So rigorous analytic thinking involves not just making connections and distinctions, but seeing the connections that our distinctions obscure and the distinctions that our connections obscure. It's about seeing around those corners. Um, it also means establishing context because context is what locates things in relation to other things, connecting and distinguishing them at the same time, so to speak.
take, for example, the words house and palace. Both identify objects, and both of those objects fall under the rubric of building. That could be considered part of their context. But there are differences as well as connections between houses and palaces, as there are between many, almost any object, idea, relationship, or attribute we can think of. That's why we have separate words for them. Um, a golf ball is both similar to and different from a football. And sport is the main context for both. <clears throat> so analysis is about clarifying what we're talking about. It's about analytic precision. It's about how things relate to each other. How things that we're talking about are both are at once related and distinct. It's not rocket science, it's just rigor, intellectual rigor on the dialectical scale. But it's a form of intellectual rigor that animates all of the liberal arts. We begin with definitions, but definitions are merely conventions for meaning. Uh, they're limited, they're often inadequate, and they're sometimes contestable. So they're simply logical devices that are necessary for language to work at all. They don't get us where we want to go as far as clar clarified meanings. <clears throat> to summarize what I've said thus far, critical thinking is rational thinking. There are different but connected forms and levels of rationality. And most of them fall on the spectrum I've identified that includes formal logic, informal logic, and analytic thinking. I've left out use, use of logic in the scientific method, empirical and computational rigor, things like that, which relate to this spectrum, but are somewhat off to a side, perhaps. If this sounds rather dry and philosophical, that's because uh, it's the nature of thinking. It can't be avoided. But don't worry. We don't all have to become philosophers to be critical thinkers. Quite the contrary. I, I would argue, in fact, that we are already philosophers. Because just by using language, we do many of the things that philosophers do. When we speak, we use abstractions. We commute between the abstract and the particular, make distinctions and connections. We break things down to understand their meanings and show how they connect with other things. These are all the most basic philosophical tasks. Language itself is a rational tool organized by rules, no matter how passionately we may speak or even how rhetorically or uh, however we may speak. Another distinction that helps to explain analysis is the one between systematic thinking and systemic thinking. Logic is an example of systematic thinking according to rigid rules and for specific reasons, to avoid fallacies and contradictions in our assertions and arguments. Sound analytic thinking is systematic also, but it it aims also to be so systemic. What I mean by that is it seeks to understand how things are connected as systems. And we do this too at some level implicitly and unconsciously whenever we talk. Language itself is a system and so is the human mind. There is no end of systems they are how our minds organize the world. Consciousness itself depends on our ability to make distinctions and connections, to individuate things, and also to see how they are related. Through the liberal arts, we can become better critical thinkers, better philosophers. Not philosophers, but better philosophers. And it doesn't matter what we study, it could be history or literature, psychology, or anything else. It's the overarching commitment to rationality that elixir 
infused into your subject matter from philosophy, at least in historical sense. The commitment to following rules and giving reasons that organizes the entire project of learning. Finally, I want to sketch out how these two ideas, the liberal arts and critical thinking, relate to citizenship. That's the third and final part of this paper. Democracy is how we govern our communities without force, how we self-govern according to rules. And citizenship is the essential com component of such democracy. <coughs> Those rules govern how we talk to each other in the process. Language itself is a form of community, a set of rules for communicating effectively. Rationality likewise is also a form of community with explicit and inexplicit rules as we've seen based upon language. So there can no, be no democracy without citizenship, without language and without rationality at least some rationality. We're seeing right now in the United States how much irrationality, uh, lies, denials of facts, conspiracy theories, the rejection of science, how all of that hurts the democratic process. Even the wearing of masks under COVID has become a focus of irrationality of denying science and putting personal freedom and political identity ahead of the public interest. And the current attempts to make voting more difficult are also a direct assault on the concept of citizenship. Citizenship per se, leaving aside our peculiar American problems at the moment, citizenship per se has many aspects. But for our purposes, I believe it can be boiled down to three basic forms, which are separate but inter interdependent. They overlap, they form a system, in other words. First, there's a political or civic participation, which we're all familiar with. It includes voting, speaking, volunteering, demonstrating, organizing, and so forth. The teaching of civic literacy is obviously crucial to this kind of citizenship. And to digress again, we do a poor job of it in the United States. I would like to see, for example, a mandatory civics component in the scholastic aptitude test for college and university admissions in America. That would help. Uh, the second form of citizenship, which is first of all means it is, sorry, which is economic citizenship, which, which means being a productive member of a community, whatever it is that you do for work. Um, it also means being a critical consumer who's aware of our, your choices and their wider ramifications, for example, in terms of the environment or economic justice for workers. Um, and not simply as a one-on-one -on -one to one transaction between you and a producer or provider of a service. Finally, uh, the third kind of citizenship is cultural citizenship, <coughs> which means taking part in the conversations in society that inform who we are through the media, which are also a key component of civic citizenship, to the arts, to religion, to sports, to popular culture, and so on. It's a broad umbrella here. The three forms of citizenship I've identified, civic, economic, and cultural, form a loose triangular system. Each of the three sectors affects and is affected by the other two. And as important as STEM and technical and vocational learning are, they are mainly preparation for economic citizenship, for a particular kind of productive employment. All well and good, but I believe what is unique about the liberal arts is that they promote not one or two, but all three forms of citizenship. 
So that's perhaps the main idea I hope to leave with you, that liberal learning prepares students for the entire triangle of citizenship. And there is a larger point behind that one, uh, which I've alluded to. Without the liberal arts, there can be no democracy. If we only had the other kinds of learning, as important as they are, if we only had medic medical training, if we only had engineering, if we only had computer science, we could not become citizens in the full sense. We could not understand how democracies work and why and what interests are at stake and how our interests are involved and when our interests must, must give way to the public interest. So this ancient clumsy idea, the idea of the liberal arts, which embodies reason, also embodies democratic life. It is only by being informed critical thinkers that we maintain our democratic traditions. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to your questions and further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for this beautiful exchange of words. I want to say this incredible line of yours. We don't have to become philosophers in order to think critically or to be critical. We'll remove all the barriers and the hesitations, give our participants a new motivation mm -hmm. to think critically. And this critical thinking in the context of liberal arts will hopefully help all the participants to explore new horizons of knowledge. Thank you once again. Now, I request all the participants to participate in question answer session. You can either raise your hand or you drop your questions in the chat box. Thank you. Well, Nimra, I just want to add to what you said. Um, that, or to reemphasize what you said, which is that we don't have to be philosophers to do philosophy. We can't help doing philosophy when we speak, even when we're, as I said, speaking rhetorically or polemically, there's a component of rationality, even if it's a purely strategic or practical rationality of trying to manipulate somebody um, to avoid all rationality is to be incapable of acting or speaking in any way. So um, philosophy is uh, in that sense, the patrimony of anyone who uses language, not just of philosophers and my point, which I think you cap you captured, is that critical thinking gets us higher up on the scale as being thinking philosophically, which is the same, really the same thing as saying thinking rigorously. Sure, so we shall move to our first question that has been dropped in the chat box. Should I read it for you, sir? Please. The first question is from Muhammad Tayyab, and he asks, how can we enable ourselves to think critically? He has actually asked three questions. Should I ask them one by one, or should I read them all at once? Uh, I can see them, but it might help if you read them one by one, because they're big questions. <laughs> OK, sir. The first question is, how can we enable ourselves to think critically? Yeah, there are several, I think several answers. That's a bit, big question, but obviously 
um, simply simply reading and and talking and uh, getting an education, a non-technical education. And by the way, as I said, technical education is fine, and it it certainly inculcates forms of important forms of rationality, but the kind of critical thinking we're talking about here, which involves discerning meanings, discerning values, discerning truth from opinion, truth from fiction, truth from belief, etc. cetera. Um, I think that tends to require the kind of exposure to scholarship in the social sciences, humanities, and so on. So I think any education in the liberal arts is an education in critical thinking. Um, and whether, you, whether you're in doing French colonial literature or queer studies or history, whatever it is, the same rational components can and should come through to you. Uh, the same uh, experience of and practice in making coherent logical arguments and so on. <coughs> and uh, other than that, I think it's 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 a matter of just uh, being self-aware and self-conscious when we speak, when we write. Uh, the same way we're critical of others, be critical of ourselves and careful in our expression and careful with language, uh, following Hobbes's dictum that words are wise men's counters, but the money of fools, a uh, very important point I think he made uh, that uh, I see in America a lot of political dialogue where words are being used as the money of fools. Um, so that's another way, but there's no, obviously no simple silver bullet to becoming a critical thinker. It's a process of education, which I suspect most of you have achieved. The question is how to teach it to others. Yeah. The second question is, is rationality possible in an orthodox and a conservative society? If so, then how can we democratize the idea of rational thinking? Yeah, that's a tough one. And I have to say, um, it's certainly possible in groups like yours, your wonderful group, which is trying to promote critical thinking. Um, there, there are obvious political limits to what you can do with it. Um, um, as there sometimes are in America, um, but uh, can you can you restate the question again so I can remind myself because it's quite okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. He's asking: Is rationality possible in an orthodox and a conservative society? Yeah. If so then how can we democratize the idea of rational thinking? Yeah. Um, yeah. Each time I hear you say that new things, new problems arise. <laughs> um, uh, of course, a conservative society is a general term. It may be more or less democratic, but um, I think orthodox communities are probably especially resistant to critical thinking. Um, I've, I've seen in under COVID in the United States and Israel and other places how orthodox communities uh, refuse to get vaccinated and ignore science and so on in, in a conscious effort to uh, continue their Orthodox ways and their communities, um, which on one level you can respect or even admire, but on another, it creates a serious health hazard for the rest of society. So I would call that a, 
a barrier to rationality, certainly, and it's a tough, tough thing. Whenever, whenever the rationality itself becomes politicized and becomes um, a political goal, you certainly have uh, a problem because you're 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 dealing with a limited democracy, and uh, we're seeing that in the United States now, where one of the major political parties has retreated to. Uh, very right wing, if not uh, racist uh, values. And it's, it's hard to have a normal democratic dialogue with an anti-democratic force. The third question is, is political consciousness necessary for rational thinking? Great question, great question. I tend to, I would tend to think it's the other way around or that, uh, or that they are, they co-evolve at the same time. I think one can become a rational thinker without political consciousness. I don't think you can develop a coherent political consciousness without rationality, uh, at least some rationality. Uh, as I, as I implied in my talk, there's a certain modicum of rationality embedded in all language and even in all consciousness. Uh, we cannot be conscious beings without uh, identifying things in time and space, uh, individuating objects, recognizing events and causes, causes and effects. There are certain basic rational animals on this planet. Uh, and in fact, lower species of animals to some extent probably exercise the same or similar forms of rationality just to get by, to find their prey or to get food or whatever. Um, so, but we're talking about a broader concept of rationality here that includes a lot of practical reasoning, ends, means, calculations, how to achieve things efficiently, which is not really the rationality I've been talking about, um, which is kind of the intellectual side of it, which is more about identifying things in the world uh, honing meanings, achieving clarity, achieving breadth, depth, and clarity and rigor, um, as opposed to uh, maximizing some material uh, goals in the world. So there's a very broad distinction there between practical and intellectual rationality. So I, I hope I answered the question. I think I think rationality comes before everything a conscious being does if they do it uh, effectively. Um, but I suppose they can evolve together too. Okay, sir. Dr. Rashid wants to know, can critical thinking go within curriculum of liberal arts? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Can Dr. Rashid wants to know, yeah. Can critical thinking go within curriculum of liberal arts? I, th I think I didn't quite understand the question there. Um, can you state it differently? Sir, he wants to ask, can critical thinking can be somehow incorporated within the curriculum of oh, liberal arts? Yes. Uh, here's the thing. Um, that's a good question. Um, within the critical thinking, so-called critical thinking community of scholars, which tends to be, a, uh, in the United States at least, a, a somewhat marginalized ghetto in the academic world, um, they're not uh, considered crazy, but they're considered a little off the mainstream people who, who uh, beat the drum of critical thinking all the time, 
and that's unfortunate. But uh, there's always there's always been in the the critical thinking has always had something of an identity crisis in America and never found a real home in the universities. Uh, it's found certain movements and certain uh, ghettos where it's thrived. Um, there's a journal called Etc. A, a general review of semantics, which um, is one of the places where critical thinking is the chief enterprise. Um, but there's always been uh, disputes about it and within it. And there's always been lack of clarity as to whether it's something you teach on its own or teach within all of the different disciplines. Um, having studied it fairly closely myself, my own opinion um, is that it doesn't need to be and isn't profitably taught as a separate standalone subject, that it's implicit in everything we study. And therefore, uh, studying whatever we study in the liberal arts will get us up the ladder of critical thinking toward a more philosophical, toward a more rigorous approach to learning and uh, and uh, once you've reached uh, certainly the graduate level, I think pretty much almost everyone is what I would call a critical thinker. Um, it's not an impossible goal like uh, uh, it, it's, it can be achieved and I think it can be achieved within the curriculum, not as a, as a specific uh, uh, part of the curriculum apart from the others. But that's been Sorry, a bit contested view. Sir, he wants to know why do we appeal to our deepest personal biases in our yeah. socioeconomic and political life and not rationality instead? Well, we love our biases, don't we? Our biases are part of our belief system, part of our value structure, which is the essential part of who we are. I don't think rationality is, for most of us, the essential part of who we are because rationality is purely instrumental. Whether it's the practical rationality I alluded to before or the intellectual rationality we're calling critical thinking. Um, it's, it's purely instrumental, which means it's extremely important, but it's the means, not the end. And the, the end is learning, it's democratic dialogue, it's clear debate, um, it's expressing who we are and respecting who someone else is if they're different. Um, so it's very hard to get past our biases. It, it, it requires some work. And one of the good things about <coughs> critical thinking texts and l laundry lists of uh, guideposts to critical thinking, so to speak, is they just are reminders of the things we should stay away from, uh, the fallacies that uh, don't help to advance dialogue. Um, but we're not going to get away from our biases necessarily, and certainly not from our core values, nor should we. Um, and uh, that's why uh, the Scottish philosopher David Hume said, um, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. Uh, and what he meant by that is, the val our values are what count in the end and reasoning is how we achieve them in concert with other people. Um, it's not the end in itself. Reasoning is not the end in itself. It's a, it's a form of community that enables us to get along and maybe achieve some of our joint values 
together. I hope that answers the question. I, these are great questions, but they're wide open, wide open to interpretation. So he further wants to know, does informal logic help us to make sound argument? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I would say there are two main, uh, two main subdivisions within informal logic. And one is the re rhetoric side, which comes directly from Aristotle and medieval rhetoricians, um, which teaches you how to make arguments well. Now, it doesn't mean that the arguments are necessarily uh, valid or arguments for good things. Um, rhetoric can help you to manipulate an audience. It can even, I suppose, make you a clever liar or dissembler. But uh, most of rhetoric is about making good arguments and avoiding fallacies. Um, and then there's the rest of informal logic, which is about avoiding other kinds of fallacies, biases, blunders in our own thinking that directly hobble us and prevent us from being effective uh, speakers or actors. So yes, the answer is definitely uh, learning to make uh, better arguments as part of critical, uh, part of uh, informal logic as part of the spectrum of critical thinking. Okay, sir. Mr. Adnanullah wants to ask question orally. Please, Mr. Adnanullah, ask. Uh, hello, sir. I hope uh, my sound is clear. Yes, it is, Adnan. Uh, I uh, firstly, I I would like to thank you and uh, tell you that I feel fully honored uh, to 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 listen to you or uh, having a seminar a webinar with you, and then I extend my appreciations to the organizers also, sir. Uh, uh, due to continuous distortion, I couldn't uh, hear the whole lecture or the whole presentation properly. But from the parts that I heard or I listened to. Uh, I I, con I concluded that uh, democracy and uh, critical thinking go hand in hand, and we cannot separate them. And uh, and uh, while answering a question, you also said that uh, rationality and critical thinking come first before everything. But if we see, uh, sir, in the third world countries, uh, we cannot see either uh, critical thinking or uh, democracy. Uh, uh, democracy, favorable democracy. We see democracy, uh, but they, it is like a kind of so-called democracy and uh, uh, like a kind of suffocated and handicapped uh, democracy. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, uh, do the people of the third world countries lack critical thinking and rationality or uh, lack of democracy? Well, probably both, but I think uh, the foundation of education is necessary to advance both to the state where there can be a meaningful democracy. Um, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question. It's uh, um, there's a there's as I suggested just in language itself. There's a modicum of rationality and critical thinking or potential critical thinking. Um, very smart people can say very smart things without having gone to university uh, and can be very effective citizens, in fact. Um, but um, for whole societies, I don't think that uh, without that uh, fertile uh, substrate of education, I don't think uh, democracies can really flourish, um, which is unfortunate. So, protecting of human rights against 
the natural human uh, will to power and to cruelty and to oppression uh, requires a certain level of argumentation, a certain le level of political organizing, a certain level of political participation, all of which I think uh, tend to be, uh, tend to go together with higher levels of education in general, though there may be exceptions. It's a really good question though. Because obviously there are many places in the world where we'd like to see transitions, uh, not necessarily toward Western industrial societies, but toward fairer, more just, more democratic societies, more inclusive societies where human rights are protected. And I think critical thinking and education are a big part of that. Okay, sir. Mr. Tayyab wants to know, sophists were quite rhetorical, rhetorical. Can we say that they were rational as well? Sophists, the Greek sophists. Sophists um, were quite rhetorical. Can yeah. we say that they were rational as well? I think so, yes, um, in the sense that rhetoric is a form of means ends rationality. It's a rationality of maximizing ends, which might be good ends or bad ends. It might be, as I said earlier, it might be political persuasion, it might be commercial persuasion. Um, uh, it might be a persuasion that the earth is flat um, so um, the ends aren't always as sound as the arguments, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a certain instrumental rationality in that too, I think. Um, and I think you see that if you go back to the early texts like Aristotle's The Rhetoric, um, I think he recognizes both the val validity of the, the field and the potential dangers for for uh, polemicists and whatnot. And in modern times, uh, bloggers or Twitter feeds that, you know, uh, are effective, but don't make good arguments. Now I would like our respected speaker for concluding remarks. Well, thank you. I really have enjoyed speaking with all of you. And uh, how I think how I want to conclude is simply to repeat what I said at the end of my paper, which is there's an ecosystem of rational critical thinking citizenship and democracy and liberal learning. Um, they reinforce one another. They really can't exist without each other. Um, and uh, I think that's the best argument I know of for critical thinking is that it's, it doesn't just, um, promote, it certainly doesn't promote wisdom. It's, it, it doesn't just promote uh, clarity and coherence, but it's really essential to a democratic process and a world where everyone counts. Um, and I think, again, the liberal arts are the, are the key educational mode for, for teaching that without uh, teaching it explicitly uh, as a standalone discipline, which I don't think it needs to or should be. Um, I think it's much better integrated in as the quasi-philosophical component of all the different disciplines we study. Um, and 
it's, it's uh, as I said, it's an ecosystem where we learn to think both systemically and systematically. And it's the systemic thinking, the analytic thinking that is the heart and soul of how we approach the liberal arts uh, uh, in the way I've described. And uh, I'd be happy to email a copy of my paper to anyone who wants who may have missed a few points. Uh, it, it'll be available. Um, but um, the bottom, bottom line, I think, is that uh, democracies cannot exist without liberal learning without, if we only had STEM and engineering and technology and no citizens educated in anything else, um, I don't think you could have any meaningful form of democracy and you'd have a very dark, uh, dark world. And I applaud what you're doing in Pakistan and I'm thrilled to be a small part of it and, and share my views and get your feedback. It's been a wonderful experience for me. And I look forward to hopefully participating in the future in some of your other uh, events. Now I would like to invite respected president of PAS for vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so far as uh, this uh, PAS is concerned, uh, it's a major task uh, has been to promote critical thinking and uh, liberal art. And you may say that uh, it has been doing since, uh, nine, since 2017. And uh, all our team uh, it has been doing its best to provide uh, a, this platform to all students, uh, scholars, and uh, we are very thankful to Jeff for your contribution, for your precious time that you have given today to this uh, particular uh, society, uh, President Association for Student Services. Uh, so far as uh, the liberal art and critical thinking is concerned, I do agree, and we have learned a lot from your discussion, from your this particular uh, additional that added a lot to our knowledge. No doubt in it, uh, one of the questions that was that uh, uh, the society so far as we are living in is, a, is an orthodox society, uh, but we have to understand it that many a society, uh, when we talk about the European society, the early European societies, when we talk about the uh, American society, on different societies, they have also, they come across the, the orthodox uh, values. We have seen that there was a time that they, they, had, they have witnessed uh, uh, orthodoxy and then we have seen there was a, a renaissance and then we have seen reformation and then uh, enlightenment. So all that, uh, that was the effort of some of the people, they have changed the entire scenario. So change is inevitable. I do agree with uh, the very honorable uh, speaker that change is inevitable. And uh, no doubt in it that democracy and uh, liberal art, they go hand in hand. We need to understand uh, this in this particular scenario, there are different kinds of biases we have to face, is, face it. And uh, the society, there are people in society, they become the sign of change in that particular society. So therefore, our organization, the past, past and many other, uh, they are trying their best, best to, to bridge this gap, to, to fill that vacuum that is in the society. We have been uh, seeing since decades that uh, no doubt there is a kind of uh, orthodox and uh, such type of things uh, we have been. Secondly, uh, we have seen that this change would come gradually. It, it, it is abrupt change does not bring any fruitful um, uh, impression in the society. So gradual change is required and we try our best and we need to uh, tolerate uh, different segments of society. We know very well that we are and we have to understand it that this is a diverse society of diverse culture. So therefore, 
uh, we are trying our best to uh, promote this critical thinking and then so far as a liberal art is concerned uh, because it is the need of the time change uh, is something that uh, it doesn't wait for anyone else and the knowledge is something that always uh, the a each society we have seen that is passing through transition so it takes time and uh, no doubt in it that efforts would bring fruit uh, so far as uh, uh, today's speaker is concerned added a lot to our knowledge we are on behalf of uh, pass professor association for student services and the management of the pass uh, i would say thank to your uh, services that you have uh, given today and we have learned a lot thanks a lot uh, then i would like to say thanks to uh, moderator as well as the participants very good questions we have seen and uh, the very good answers and replies so therefore uh, this uh, program and this kind of activity must go on and on and all this is possible because of the very good services uh, being provided by scholars abroad and uh, scholars within the uh, this particular country so again i would like to say thank to uh, thanks to uh, the honorable scholar uh, for such a precious precious time he has spent with us thank you thank you very much Appreciate it. Now I want to thank our respected speaker once again for taking out his time, his precious time, and sharing his thought-provoking views on critical thinking, and all our participants for taking out time from their busy routines and joining us in this webinar, and the society and comments. secretariat for collaboration in making this all happen thank you very much additionally i want to announce the next activity of pass that shall be conducted on 14 june 2021 and its topic will be teaching critical thinking and dr peter from queensland australia will be speaking in that webinar thank you all thank you very much please take care and now we are about to end the meeting thank you for your time hopefully we all shall meet again and this journey shall continue okay.